قد كفاني علم ربي من سؤالي واختياري فدعائي وابتهالي شاهد لي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد From today we will commence tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf and by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we will continue through this surah until we complete the entire surah. Surah Al-Kahf is a beautiful surah filled with many lessons. There are stories, there are advices and it is a surah that should be a regular part of a Muslim's life. The Prophet ﷺ has encouraged us to recite this surah every Friday, as most people know. Some riwayat mention that it should be the first ten surahs. Some riwayat mention that it should be the last few surahs, uh, sorry, the, la the first few verses, ten verses, or the last ten verses, or the entire surah. The preferable practice is to recite the entire surah every Friday. And numerous ahadith indicate that a person who does that will be protected from the fitna of Dajjal. And the fitna of Dajjal is such that even the Prophet Muhammad wasallam sought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection from it. In fact, he والسلام, stated that all the Prophets والسلام, warned their nations about Dajjal. And he والسلام, spoke about Dajjal in great detail, at great length, more than any other Prophet had. And the Prophet وسلم, informed the Ummah that it will come out, this Dajjal will emerge at some point in this Ummah and there are indicators, things that will happen before that, and they will be markers to represent that the time of Dajjal is near. One hadith that Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah has mentioned in Zad al-Mu'ad, and he has said it is Sahih, is that a person who recites this surah every Friday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates for him a pillar of nur that goes from him all the way up to the skies. Another hadith mentions that a person who recites this regularly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives, pardons his sins from one Jumu'ah to the next Jumu'ah. So it's a very important surah, practically speaking, and there are many people who read it regularly. So its significance also requires that we understand the surah. We understand what it is that we are reciting. This surah is the 18th surah in the Quran in terms of the sequence and it consists of 110 verses and the entire surah was revealed in Mecca. The background behind this was that once the Prophet ﷺ began conveying his message of one God and of the concept of hereafter and the concept of his own prophethood and the prophethood of those prophets who preceded him. People had many questions. He was met with a wide spectrum of responses from those that accepted his message right away to those that opposed him tooth and nail and did everything in their power to, to hurt him, to harm him and to stop this message from, from getting out to other people and of course inflicting punishments on anyone who was accepting it. Once the Quraysh 
said that let's do a background check on this person and find out if the knowledge that he is getting is from the same sources as people who believe in various prophets get their knowledge from. So they sent two people from Quraysh, an nadr ibn al-Harith and Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. They sent these two to go and speak to the Jewish scholars in Medina and give them a detailed explanation about this person, who he was, what he was saying, and how they could check, how, could they, could, how they could verify to see if he is a true messenger or not. So these rabbis told these two representatives that one way to check is to ask him three questions. And if he can answer those three questions, then he is a prophet. And only a prophet will have access to the answers to those questions. But if he is an imposter, if he is a fake, then he will not be able to answer these questions. So they said, ask him about a group of youngsters that left their homeland in times past and never returned. What is the story of those? And ask him about a man who traveled from the east extreme of the earth to the western extreme of the earth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him many powers and abilities who was that person and what about him and the third question is ask him about the ruh the soul that the human being has what is the reality of this soul and if he gives you the answers to this then he is a prophet otherwise he is not these two men came back and reported all of this to Quraysh who in turn assembled and deputed a group of people to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him these three questions. And they said, if you can answer these, we will know that you are a Prophet, otherwise we will know you are fake. The Prophet ﷺ told them, I will tell you tomorrow. I will inform you tomorrow. But at that time, he did not say insha'Allah. So, he was expecting that Jibreel will come and give him the answer. But the next day came and he had no answer. So he told them, no, I don't have an answer yet. Then another day passed and another day and another day. And like this, two whole weeks passed. Fifteen days passed. No revelation is coming to him. No message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people of Quraysh are using this, exploiting this for their propaganda. That look, the jinns that come to him and give him all his information have also discarded him. They used to think that he is getting information from jinns. Even his jinns have discarded him. And they said all kinds of things which deeply hurt the Prophet after 15 days, Jibreel came with wahi of this surah. The Prophet said, Oh Jibreel, you have delayed. You have come after so long. So, the answer was given. It's mentioned in the Quran, وَمَا نَتَلَزَّلُ وَمَا نَتَنَزَّلُ إِلَّا بِأَمْرِ رَبِّكَ لَهُمَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِينَا وَمَا خَلْفَنَا وَمَا بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَّا We cannot descend, we cannot come down to earth until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the command. He controls everything. Everything that we do and everything that we have done, it's all in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by His instructions. But remember one thing, Allah doesn't forget. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgot. Al-Ayyadu Billah. To, to send me. No, this is, there is a, there is a reason for this. And in this same surah, the verse mentions very clearly, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Never say about anything that I'm going to do that tomorrow. Unless you also say, Allah. 
illa yasha Allah. Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to do it. If Allah wants me to do it, then I will do it. If He does not want, I am not able to. In any case, the surah opens up with praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitaba wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja. All praise. Praise is a general word that we use for hamd. But hamd is, is far beyond praise. The word hamd is an act that a person does with their tongue. It is words that are spoken by the tongue. When a person receives something good from someone that they have done on purpose. This is hamd. Athana'u bil lisani ala al-jameel al-ikhtiyari. Ni'matan kana o ghayraha. Whether it's a ni'mah or it's something else, but someone has done something good to you intentionally, you praise them with their tongue for doing that good. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the doer of all good. He is the bestower of all good. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the possessor of all the attributes of virtue and good. He has all of them. Al Mustajmi'u li Jami'i Sifat al Kamal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses all the attributes of perfection. And so this hamd is for a Muslim, hamd is exclusive for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one else deserves hamd. So we say Alhamdu Lillah. All praise. Whenever we attribute some good to someone or something, it should be rightfully attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses many sources and channels to give us things. But we don't do hamd of those sources and channels, those means and those causes. Hamd belongs to the one who created all of those. You can do shukr of him for giving you this and this and this and this and this. Hamd, hamd is reserved for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did Allah do? Anzala ala abdihi kitab He revealed the book, meaning the Quran, upon his slave. Now many words could have been used here ala nabiyyihi ala rasulihi but here ala abdihi upon his slave that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam high as his status may be he is after all a slave of allah he is a slave of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is by virtue of being a slave also under the control and the command of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah has given this book of his to a slave. It's another discussion that he is no ordinary slave of Allah. But he is a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a slave does not become a partner with the master in anything. The Prophet ﷺ has so many virtues, beauties, favors, and we cannot enumerate them. But Allah is Allah. The Prophet ﷺ is not a partner to Allah in control. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la yushriku fi hukmihi ahada. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not make anyone a partner in controlling things. So the Prophet ﷺ is not a decision maker in partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. Nor does he possess the qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. The attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has many qualities of his own that Allah has given him. His ilm, his mercy, 
all of those have been bestowed upon him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala abdihi kitab But because the book has come from Allah and not from the slave, lam yaj'al lahu iwaja. This book has no deviance in it. Iwaj means for something to be crooked. Iwaj is the opposite of mustaqim. Mustaqim means completely straight. Iwaj means it might be a little curved. It might be a little bent. It might be a little off track. This book doesn't have any of that. It is never off track. It is never incomplete. It is never... It is never at conflict with itself. It is never self-contradictory. There is no ikhtilaf in it, meaning the book contradicts itself. Absolutely not. There is no tanaqud in it. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Don't these people ponder about the Qur'an? Don't they focus their attention to it? If this had come from anything, any source other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it would have so many self-contradictions. But it doesn't. So it's a clear book. The wahi was delayed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah wants, He will delay it. When Allah wants, He will resume it. But there is nothing wrong with the book. So very clear message. لَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجَا Instead, it is قَيِّمًا Now قَيِّم means two things. One meaning of قَيِّم is that it is upright. It is upright. It is perfectly straight. It is complete. And the other meaning of قَيِّم is an overlooker. So if the meaning of straight is is taken, it means that it's not crooked. In fact, it's very, very straight. And if the meaning of an overlooker is used, then this book is the overlooker, meaning the authority over all the previous books. It is the final book, and it has the authority to overrule what is in the previous books. Qayyiman. Why? لِيُنذِرَ بَأْسًا شَدِيدًا مِنْ لَدُنْهُ this book was revealed for two primary objectives. And these objectives are mentioned interchangeably in the Qur'an. Sometimes one is first, sometimes the other is first. What is that? To warn and to give glad tidings. And sometimes to give glad tidings and to warn. They're used interchangeably. Here, warning is brought first. And warning is brought first because of what these people had done with the Prophet ﷺ for all of these years. And most recently, what they had done with him in these last 15 days. How they had treated him. So a warning is more suitable for this occasion. That what you have been doing, remember that there is someone who can punish you for it. If the, the relationship, if the dealings had been more amicable, then perhaps the glad tiding part would have been mentioned first and then the warning part secondarily. But here the warning is mentioned first. لِيُنذِرَ بَأْسًا شَدِيدًا To warn of a very severe grasp. Grasp punishment to warn of a very severe punishment who that comes from Allah it doesn't come from Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet sallallahu is merely there to warn innama ana nadhir i am just a warner innama anta nadhir you are just a warner but to bring the punishment is not in your capacity it is not in your control Allah brings that when He wants, if He wants, upon whom He wants. So, Milladunhu, to give this slave has been given this book that is perfect, it is complete, so that A, He can warn you of an impending punishment that will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
But at the same time, وَيُبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا حَسَنًا To give glad tidings to those believers who do good deeds. Not just believers. Not وَيُبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ No. الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ Those mu'mineen, those believers who are also doing good deeds. They are completely engaged. This is what they do. They do good things. What will they get? أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا حَسَنًا They will get a beautiful reward. And that reward will not be temporary. مَا كِثِينَ فِيهِ أَبَدًا They will remain in this reward forever and ever. Reward here, of course, referring to Jannah. So they will stay in this reward with the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forever and ever. And also, to give a specific warning to those who claim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken a son. So who is this referring to? It's referring to three groups of people. Those who say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken a child. Walada. A. The Jews who said that Uzair alayhi salam is a son of Allah. B. The Christians who said that Isa alayhi salam is the son of Allah. And C. The pagans of, of Quraysh who used to think and believe that the angels are the daughters of Allah. They used to think of the angels as females. And they would say these are the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this warning is for all of those categories. Anyone who attributes some form of offspring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be forewarned. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ وَلَا لِآبَائِهِمْ they have no knowledge of this. So they say, well, this is what our fathers used to believe. Allah says, their fathers, their forefathers also had no knowledge. They have no knowledge of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if they're just doing this because their forefathers did, well, their forefathers also did not have any knowledge. كَبُرَتْ كَلِمَةً تَخْرُجُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ إِنْ يَقُولُونَ إِلَّا كَذِبًا what they're saying is immense. It is a very big statement that is emerging from their mouths. Kaburat kalimatan. It's huge. And in Surah Maryam, towards the end, a more detailed picture is painted of what happens when someone utters such a word. وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدًا They claim that Ar-Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken children. لَقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا إِدَّا You have brought forth a concept that's very strange. It's nonsensical. But it is a very dangerous thing you are saying. تَكَادُ السَّمَاوَاتُ يَتَفَطَّرْنَ مِنْهُ the skies are about to split because of it. وَتَنْشَقُّ الْأَرْضِ And the earth is about to open up. وَتَخِرُّ الْجِبَالُ هَدَّى And the mountains are about to collapse. And دَعَوْ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ وَلَدَى Because they called upon a child, an offspring for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا يَنْبَغِي لِلْرَّحْمَانِ أَنْ يَتَّخِذَ وَلَدَى It is not appropriate for Allah, for Ar-Rahman, to take children, to have a child. In this case, specifically Isa alayhi salam, who is a major, a major uh, subject of the surah, surah Maryam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, anyone who walks on the earth, anything that's in the skies, they are all the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will come, present themselves, illa atir rahmani abda. They will come to him merely as a slave. So, when people say something like this, it is in fact 
a very dangerous statement and a very uh, a very ugly statement. Khair. In yaquruna illa kadiba. What they're saying is nothing but a lie. But you, O Prophet of Allah, who is seeing this and hearing this and working so hard to invite them towards one Allah, to invite them towards the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get them to change their beliefs, you are exhausting yourself. And the fact that many of them are not ready to believe, it is pushing you to an extreme where you're being very, very hard on yourself. Perhaps you will destroy yourself after them out of sorrow that they will not accept this message. Perhaps you will destroy yourself. So this is a very very powerful statement. It paints a picture of what kind of effort and what level of effort and exertion the Prophet ﷺ was engaged in. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has ordered him to convey the message, is, in other words, telling him, Oh my beloved, take it easy, go easy on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. You're going to destroy, you're going to kill yourself. And this message is, is conveyed at numerous places in the Quran. And many verses in the Quran where Allah is saying that look, you might lose your life in this. The way you're going, it looks like you're going to kill yourself. You're pushing yourself so hard, so hard, so hard. Why? If they don't believe in this book, if they don't believe in this message that we have given you, so the sorrow of that and the pain of that might just kill you. As far as these people are concerned, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Everything that is on top of this earth is an adornment. It is a decoration. إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ We have created whatever is on this earth as an adornment for it, as a decoration for it. Why? So that we test those who reside on this earth, ayyuhum ahsanu amala, which one of them comes forth with the best deeds. So, this is first was the statement that you are pushing yourself too hard, and now is a statement saying that look, don't take what these people are doing so seriously. Don't take it so seriously. Don't worry about the world and its people. Don't worry so much about what they are saying and what they are thinking. You are doing your job. You're doing your job. You're doing it wonderfully. And you are fulfilling the haqq of the amana, of the trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon you. But don't go to an extreme where you are going to destroy yourself. So everything that's on this earth is a beauty. So, Sayyid ibn Jubair, rahimahullah, reports from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, that zina here refers to the people. All the people of this world, because the world only looks good when it's populated. Whether it's cities and towns, or it's villages, it, they only look good when, it's, when they're populated by people. You have a beautiful city with wonderful structures and buildings and sky rises. 
and all of those things, but <coughs> nobody lives there. It's a ghost town. So the people of this world are an adornment of this world. So this was the tafsir of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. And another riwayah from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu is that zina here refers to those that are in control. These people are in control. They make things look good but don't take them too seriously. And others have said that this refers to everything. It's not restricted to people. This refers to all things of beauty. Plants and trees and vegetation and crops and everything in this world that gives it, that gives it an attractive and appealing look. All of those things are included in this. And if you look closely, you will find beauty in everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. However, don't get too lost in it. Don't take it too seriously. Like the Prophet ﷺ himself said, In the dunya khadiratun hulwa. And the other riwayah, In the dunya hulwatun khadira. That this dunya is it's sweet and attractive. Wa inna Allah mustakhrifukum fiha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you control over some things in it. Allah is going to give somebody a certain amount of wealth. He's going to give another person a certain amount of authority. He's going to give another person a certain amount of authority. You're going to get different things from it. When Allah mustakhlifukum fiha, fayanzura kayfa ta'amaloon. And all of that is only going to be to see what you do with it, what your acts are. And in fact, in another hadith of Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna akhwafa ma akhafu alaykum. ما يخرج الله لكم من زهرة الدنيا. My biggest fear for you is that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala starts putting the beauties of this world at your disposal, because you might not be able to survive that test. So people are tested with two extremes. There is the extreme of of poverty, which is of course it is a test, and then there is the extreme of having access to anything and everything that you want it's also a test but in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the success lies not in having it or not having it it lies in what line of action a person adopts in their life what attitude what belief and what deed a person adorns them with. So a person could be in terms of finances and, and in any kind of position, any kind of situation. But the, the access to those things or lack of access to those things, it makes no difference in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as far as the status of that person is concerned. Ahsanu amala. Allah is subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing to see who does the best deeds Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu used to say in tafsir of this ayah that the best amal is akhdun bi haqqin wa infaqun fi haqqin ma'al iman is to hold on to the truth and to spend what one has in good causes with iman and at the same time ada'ul fara'id fulfilling the obligations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed on a person wajtinabul muharim and abstaining from the things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram. وَالْإِكْثَارُ مِنَ الْمَنْدُوبِ إِلَيْهِ And to do as much extra good deeds as one possibly can. Sufyan Thawri rahimahullah says in tafsir of this ayat that أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا means أَزْهَدُهُمْ fiha. Allah has made everything in this world a beauty, an adornment, a decoration لِيَبْلُوَهُمْ to test them who abstains from it the most who displays the most zuhd to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now here the discussion has to take place 
about what is zuhud. Because if somebody is a zahid, somebody has a great deal of zuhud in their life. So how do we translate zuhud? And how do we, how do we apply it? What does it mean? Because zuhud literally means disinterest. To be disinterested in something, to be detached from something, to have a lack of inclination towards something, this is zuhud. Literally speaking. So, the ulama have given various explanations for zuhud. Sufyan Thawri rahimahullah says that zuhud has nothing to do with wearing a specific type of clothing, wearing rough clothes for example or wearing the clothes that ascetics wear. It's not about that. It's about shortening your expectations in this dunya. What that means is that don't have very long, drawn out plans for dunya. Keep your plans for dunya short and brief related to your immediate future. Don't think and say, okay, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, or I want to have this, then after this I want to have that, and then I want to have that, and then I want to have that. A person who does not have this kind of an attitude is a Zahid. In other words, they're not too concerned with what happens very far down the road. They're saying, this is what I have, this is what I need for the immediate future, and the rest is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a person who does that, Imam Qurtubi rahimahullah says, that a person who has this kind of an attitude towards life will not be overly concerned with eating fine foods, wearing fine clothes, and having, you know, all the nicest things, possessions. This person is going to be content with very little in life. They'll be perfectly happy with just a little bit of things. And they're only going to take from this dunya what they need. Others have explained zuhud as when a person does not does does not seek recognition in this world. They want to go about doing things, good things, without anybody knowing about it. So the moment a person wants recognition, acknowledgement for, for anything, they want to be acknowledged, for example, that they're a wealthy person. Somebody, another person wants to be acknowledged that they're very well educated. Another person wants recognition for some achievement. Somebody wants recognition for good deeds. Somebody wants to be acknowledged as you know, somebody who's, who's done such and such good act and such and such good act. When a person no longer has those tendencies, they do not want praise or recognition from people, this person has the quality of zuhud. Bishr ibn al-Harith, rahimahullah, who was a great zahid himself, he says, if I were to tell you about the love of dunya, and you would be able to abstain from it, then you would understand what zuhud is. He said, what is the love of dunya? Very interesting. He said, حُبُّ dunya, حُبُّ لِقَاءِ nas." The love of meeting people. The love of knowing people and having people know you. <coughs> what that means is that somebody who is overly concerned about who they meet and all the time meeting more people and new people and meeting people and meeting people. This is a weakness inside that represents the fact that they are overly concerned, overly taken by people. A person who has this is living for people. They want to be accepted by people. And as long as people are accepting them, 
and then more people and more people they're happy they're feeding this desire but a person who no longer has this desire it means really they're spending their life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so to want to be known or to want to meet every single person that's out there it's a sign of a weakness inside either you want something from them or you have this weakness inside that you feel incomplete until you go and meet everybody now it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that we stop meeting people but what it means is you meet who you need to meet for your deen and for your dunya and those who you don't need to meet you're content with not meeting them it doesn't mean you're arrogant or you're being a snob as we say in slang what it means is you have your own life you have your own business and you meet who you need to meet for those objectives and that's it that's why one shair says it just came to my mind he says لِقَاءُ النَّاسِ لَا يُفِيدُ شَيْئًا سِوَ الْهَذِيَانِ مِنْ قِيلٍ وَقَالِ فَأَقْلِلْ مِنْ لِقَاءِ النَّاسِ إِلَّا لِأَخْذِ الْعِلْمِ أَوْ إِسْلَاحِ حَالِي He says meeting people has no benefit other than useless talk قِيلَ وَقَالْ Gossip That's what you will get from people When you sit down Oh did you hear? Did you hear? Did you know? And then it's all gossip so he says, فَأَقْلِلْ مِنْ لِقَاءِ النَّاسِ إِلَّا He says, minimize your meeting with people except for two things. لِأَخْذِ الْعِلْمِ To take knowledge or to correct yourself. إِسْلَاحِ حَالِي You sit with people and spend time with people whose company is going to help build you. It's going to, it's going to form you. It's going to give you something, enrich you. Shaykh Muhammad Zakaria Rahimahullah, great muhaddith of our times, used to say that I consider this a disease. I consider it a disease. Somebody who's just all the time trying to make new friends, trying to make new friends, it's a disease. It shows a serious weakness inside. And Fulayd ibn Iyad Rahimahullah, also said to the same effect that the alama, the indication of zuhud in dunya, that a person is disinterested in, in dunya, is that a person is also disinterested in the people of dunya. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak rahimahullah says that zuhud, zuhud is when you look forward to meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The love of death, which is a strange concept for us nowadays. The love of death. Meaning that a person is focused on meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't mean, alayhi billah, they're suicidal. It doesn't mean they're in a state of manic depression. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means that they're not really living to spend time here in this temporary abode. They're living for that moment when they go in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you see all of these different statements so it would be correct to say that zuhd encompasses all of these things zuhd is a very broad concept it includes all of these things in the hadith of tirmidhi the prophet sallallahu was requested for a brief piece of advice so he said as his advice, izhad fi dunya yuhibbuk Allah. Wazhad fi ma inda nas yuhibbuk nas. Become disinterested and detached from dunya. Allah will start loving you. And become disinterested in what people have, people will start loving you. Amazing piece of advice. What else does a person want? They want the love of Allah and people naturally they want to be loved by people. Whether one person knows you or two people or three people you want to be liked and loved by those people. So the Prophet ﷺ gave us this beautiful it's not a trick but it's a key. He gave us this beautiful key that become disinterested in this dunya Allah will start loving you. Become disinterested in what people have in their hands people will also start loving you. 
So the way to gain the love of people is not to go after what people have, is to walk away from what people have and be content with what Allah has given you. وَإِنَّا لَجَاعِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا صَعِيدًا جُرُزًا All of this was about the zina, the beauty, the, the adornment of the, of the world, of the earth. Allah says, it's just a matter of time before I turn everything that is on top of this earth into dead land. سَعِيدًا جُرُزًا So Sa'id means a flat plain. The word Sa'id is also used for plateau. Meaning you have some lower ground and then you have some raised ground, a flat plain that is slightly elevated. This is called Sa'id. And Juruz means dead earth, dead land. Like is mentioned in Surah as sajda أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْ أَنَّا نَسُوقُ الْمَاءَ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الْجُرُزِ فَنُخْرِجُ بِهِ زَرَعًا تَأْكُلُ مِنْهُ أَنْعَامُهُمْ وَأَنْفُسُهُمْ Do they not see? That we drive water, the clouds bearing water, to land which is dead. It has withered away. Al Ard al Juruz. And from that withered land, that desolate land, we start growing things. So everything that is in this world, that is on this world, is going to wither away. Every plant will wither away. Every tree will meet its end. It will wither away. Every building will wither away. Every human being will wither away. So this earth one day is going to become a flat plain. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it in detail in the Quran. What's going to happen after the earth starts to quake and after everything begins to crumble and fall. It's going to be recreated. And it's just going to be one flat plain. That's it. لا ترى فيها عوج ولا أمتى ويسألونك عن الجبال فقل ينسفها ربي نسفا فيذرها قاعا صفصفا لا ترى فيها عوج ولا أمتى Everything is going to be flattened, raised to the ground. So, don't bother yourself too much about the people of this dunya or about the conditions of this dunya. And no one has gone through sorrow like the Prophet ﷺ has. He says himself, أُوذِيتُ فِي اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُؤْذَ أَحَدٍ I have been hurt for the sake of Allah like no man has been hurt. وَأُخِفْتُ فِي اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُخَفْ أَحَدٍ I have been threatened in the path of Allah, for the cause of Allah, like no man has been threatened. I've been frightened like no man has been frightened. But still, he kept on doing his work. So, the human being, I mean, we turn to the Prophet ﷺ as our example for everything, including the conditions we go through in life. So even he, Ali salatu wasalam, went through extreme periods of sorrow, where he reached the point that Allah is saying, you're going to kill yourself. So he was susceptible to sorrow, to extreme sorrow. Of course, his sorrow was not for any worldly thing. That's the difference. His sorrow was not because of lack of, lack of resources, lack of food, or lack of money. We read a hadith, in which the Prophet ﷺ describes the poverty that he went through. But you will never hear or read in those ahadith that he is sad about it. He was never sad. He was hungry and he went through starvation but he never became sad that I don't have food. I don't have anything to give to my children, to my wives. But over this issue, he became extremely, extremely sad. So sad that there are dozens of verses in the Qur'an giving the Prophet ﷺ comfort. Just comforting him. It's okay. It will be okay. It will be okay. Right from the beginning, from Surah Al-Baqarah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءُنَ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْتَرْتَمْ أَمْنَمْ تُنْذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ From there, it just begins all the way to the end. 
dozens of verses of consolation to the Prophet ﷺ. So he was susceptible to sorrow, but his sorrow was because of his mission. He did not want a single person to be to escape the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent him with. So what did, did he do in those times of sorrow? He turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He bore it. So we as human beings will also go through periods of sadness and sorrow. So at that time we have to be strong. We have to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we know someone who is in that state, we need to give them consolation. If the Prophet sallallahu needed consolation, then of course every human being needs consolation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoled him over and over and over again. So this leads us to the end of verse 8 of this surah. And after this, from verse 9, the story of Ashab al-Kahf begins. And we will commence this next week insha'Allah ta'ala. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakullah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.